This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to another episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast, presented by GSMC Podcast. My name is Chris Williams, and before I get started here today, I want to make sure to remind you guys to subscribe to the podcast, make sure you never miss an episode, make sure you're always tuned in, and also, while you're at it, if you could, give us a five-star rating, give us a review, it's really helpful, it'll really help make sure that we're putting out the best content for you guys week in and week out. I also want to make sure I wish you all a happy holidays. I hope you guys were able to spend time with your family. Enjoy your days off from work, hopefully, the past couple of days. And also, watch some NBA basketball because, I mean, yesterday we had some great games. Great, great games. Starting, first and foremost, with the Battle of L.A., one of the most anticipated and biggest games of the year. And one that people think could very well be the Western Conference Finals matchup down in, down in the line in May. With the L.A. Clippers, L.A. Lakers. And from they already played once this year on opening night. And with this being the unofficial opening night of the season, as I stated on the last podcast, Christmas Day, it's only right that they played again. And boy, did it live up to the hype. I mean, this was this was the one where the first matchup, there was people out. Paul George didn't play. Kyle Kuzma didn't play. But both these teams came into this game at full strength. We were hoping for a great basketball game. And that is exactly what we got. I mean, the game started out. Um, the game started out hot. Both Kawhi and Kuzma were played very well in the first quarter. Kawhi started out with a game of fifteen. I don't know. Excuse me, fourteen. Kuzma had fifteen off the bench in like six minutes. It was amazing. He just came in and was just on fire out there to start the game. I believe went five for seven in that first quarter. And from there, the game was uh, pretty back and forth through the rest of the quarter. And um, I think the Lakers um, finished the first quarter up two if I'm not mistaken. And then from there, I mean, it was pretty close, even down towards the end of the end of the half there, up until the the Clippers kind of let the, I don't want to say let, but until the Clippers kind of allowed the Lakers to go on a little bit of run there. I believe they ended it on a, yeah, they went on a 14-2 run in the last three minutes of the second quarter, the Lakers did, in order to take a halftime lead. And at there, you're kind of like, oh, man, like what are the like how are the Clippers going to adjust because you we weren't really sure like because like I said it was this was a very anticipated game so you're hoping that the Lakers just weren't going to blow the doors off of them though I mean that would have been a um, a very big message to the rest of the league by the Lakers but when they came out in the second uh, second half the Lakers were able to keep their lead for for most of the time they they went they got they got it up to 15 even in the third but the Clippers were able to make a comeback make a run. They tied it up, so went to the fourth quarter, tied up, and I mean that. I mean that's all you would want from a game like this. Just close game heading into the fourth quarter. That's exactly what we got. And then from there, it was pretty back and forth. The Lakers went up seven um, early-ish in the fourth quarter. The Clippers were able to come back with a seven-zero run of their own. And then from there, they kind of just held it down and and were able to go on a run. I, I believe they closed the game on a seventeen-five run to take the lead. Um, there were some key key and controversial plays down at the end. I know that Lou Will missed layup when it was tied, I believe, that he ended up getting fouled on, though. I mean, it didn't really have much to do with the play, but unfortunately, Anthony Davis did run into him, so it's just one of those things where it's kind of hard to avoid that contact when they kind of go for the block, but they gave them the lead, and they never they never, they never, relinquished it. Um, Pat Beverly came with a big, big play there at the end on LeBron with the with the with the block, steal, I mean, it kind of depends on what you want to call it, but the deflection was able to deflect out of bounds, and unfortunately on the replay, if, as it was shown, it did go off of, did go off of um, LeBron. I mean, it's weird with those replays because any other time in the game, any other time, and even that quarter, outside the last two minutes, that's is going to be off um, Pat Bev, but because you can slow it down, because you can go frame by frame, it hits off LeBron, you got to call it that way. I know some people were a little... 
um, I don't want to say up in arms, but some people weren't happy about that on on social media just because that that's in theory that's not the way. It's more it's more like the letter of the law as opposed to just like applying it in the in the context where they thought it should be applied. But I mean, if it goes off the guy, if, that's why you have replay for it, to get it right. And they got it right, so you can't really complain too much about that. And obviously, Pat Bev was hyped. The Clippers were hyped. And I mean, that wasn't the only big play that Pat Bev had in terms of in terms of against LeBron. He also, unfortunately, when he went up for a, a layup and Pat, uh, LeBron tried to draw a charge and need him in the groin, and though though LeBron was able to play through it, he said after the game it kind of set him back to where he was like a few days ago when he was trying to fight through the groin injury. So we'll see if that caused him to miss any time. You hope not. You hope. You want him. You want LeBron to stay healthy, and also in lieu of the load management comments he's had um, recently, in terms of him not wanting to sit out games, it'd be interesting to see how the Lakers handle that. Just because um, this game and the regular season is very well important, but as shown by last year when LeBron missed a <laughs> good amount of time and the Lakers kind of um, um, floundered, faltered a little bit, it's important to have LeBron healthy. For the end of the season, I mean, the last year's team did not have Anthony Davis on it, so you would think they'd be able to withstand a LeBron absence a little bit better. But it'll be interesting to see how they how they handle that. Just just because it's you don't want LeBron fighting through an injury and then hurting it worse, it when when he could have just sat out a game or two, or a week or two, it, whatever whatever he needs to do to sit out to get himself right, just get yourself right. That's more important than winning a a game in January in early January on a Thursday night. So we'll see how that we'll see how that goes. But like I said, that game definitely lived up to the hype. It was everything you could ask for. Though I know some people did not ask for that new camera angle they were trying out. That was interesting as well, just because now we as as sports fans, as creatures of habit, humans, we don't really like change. So I know there was a lot of also uproar on social media about the new camera angle. And I mean, while it was definitely a little different, it took some time to get used to. Um, I. It's it's one of those things where it's like it's hard to say because like it gives you a different outlook. You can see the game a little bit differently. You can see the court a little bit differently, but at the same time, you're just like I don't I don't need to this high up kind of like follow around camera angle in terms of like the the court seems a little bit further away. The players seem a little bit further away. I can't really see as like I can see the court better, but I can't see the players as well. So it's one of those things where I, I know ESPN and ABC they're going to be working through that. They're going to be testing that out, and I know they tried that in the NFL. In the past couple years with the sky came, people didn't really like it just because it's just it's just not what we're used to. So we don't we don't really it's just like a, like I said, we're creatures of habit, so we don't like to change things up. We don't have to. And just like one of those, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So we'll see we'll see how much more the NBA, ESPN, um, aims to use that camera angle in the future. But was, I mean that game was great. Like I said, when you, NBA put it together on Christmas Day, they got exactly what they would have asked for. So. I know they're happy about that, and I know the, as we as fans are definitely happy because we got a great, great basketball game. And another game that would that looked like it was going to be great on paper was the Sixers Bucks game a little bit earlier in the day. And I mean that game, you had the arguably the best team in the NBA coming in. You had a team in the Sixers who many people thought could be the best team in the East. They hadn't always played like it. Again, people and Bead and missed games due to injury and stuff like that. So. They had their full. They had their full team on um, yesterday, and they played like it. This is exactly who fans, analysts, anybody thought the Sixers could be coming to the season. Just length, size, defense everywhere, and be dominating. And then they're making their threes. I mean, if they're going to make, I mean, they, I think they came to the game averaging about ten made threes a game, which is not bad. But if they're going to, if they can make upwards of that closer to fifteen. On, on some nights, they're going to be, I don't want to say impossible because no one's impossible to beat. No one goes undefeated, obviously. But they'll be, they'll, they'll be a team that is tough, tough, it's a tough, tough out just because if you have that spacing around and be where you can dominate the post, where he's he's almost unguardable in the post but unless you double team him, and even then it might not be enough. And if you had those people outside in the Tobias Harris's and the Josh Richardson's and the Cork Maz's and the Mike Scott, those kind of guys can hit the threes around him. I mean, it's you don't you, like you got to pick your poison. Like, what do you do? You gotta are you gonna leave and beat one on one so we can dominate almost anybody in the post? You're gonna let the sh- let the shooters get open shots. And like I said, the six. I mean, the Bucks tried to let them get the open shots, and it unfortunately backfired. But 
I mean, to start off, I mean, they got a great... This guy's got a great game from Embiid. He had 14 in the first, 23 in the first first quarter, 23 in the first half. He came out and asserted his dominance. And then on top of that, he helped, not solely, but he helped um, force Giannis into a 4 for 14 shooting in the first half. And that and that was about as big as, as the offense was just because if Giannis doesn't get going, they then it's hard. It's, it's harder for that Bucks team to get going. I mean, obviously they have guys like Chris Melton. Eric Bussell wasn't playing in this game, but they have other people that can score a little bit, but if Giannis isn't going, isn't initiating the offense, isn't knocking down the threes like he was against the Lakers a couple nights ago, then that, that team and that offense is just different, and then those missed shots can lead to transition points. I mean, Ben Simmons was good at pushing pushing the pace when Embiid wasn't in there getting getting up and down the floor, getting easy buckets, getting, getting easy shots for his teammates. And and then next thing you know, they're scoring 120 points on what many people thought and what has been the best defense in the league up to this point. So, I mean, this is the kind of game that that I would say people definitely weren't expecting when you based on how the two teams are playing. But when you match them up on paper, this is the kind of matchup that if the Sixers play at the, their play at the level that we know that they should be capable of, this is the kind of game they can put up against anybody, really. And like I'm saying, I mean, they, they led this game by 29 points, I believe, at one point. And, I mean, that's that's something that obviously hasn't happened to the Bucks. They've only lost five games this season. But just even even with just that kind of um, performance from the Sixers and the Bucks in different aspects, it was just something that I know definitely caught me off guard just a little bit. I didn't, obviously, I didn't think... They just couldn't win this game, but I didn't expect them to win it in the fashion in which they did. And they just, they looked like the Bucks didn't even deserve to be on the floor with them. And I mean, we'll see how that plays out. This, much like the Lakers-Clippers game, could be a Eastern Conference Finals matchup, Eastern Semifinals matchups at some point. I mean, if both these teams want to get to the NBA Finals, they're probably going to have to go through each other at some point, barring one of them getting beat by like a Clippers, not the Clippers, the Celtics, or like a Raptors team or something, or a Heat Heat team, or even like the Pacers, if when they get Old Depot back, they can keep it up. But this was definitely a big game from the Sixers and kind of performance that um, we we. If you were a Sixers fan, you're definitely happy for you. Hope that this is the kind of performance she would get. And if you're a Bucks fan, you're like, all right, they got us. We'll we'll regroup. We'll go back to the drawing board, and we'll hopefully have come up with a better game plan for the next time. But I mean, those are just two of the games. I mean, we still had we still had a couple other games that had out. Um, Outcomes just as, if not more surprising, than this Bucks Sixers games, and we will get to those right after this. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news, both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. surprising to some that there were definitely to me at least that Bucks Sixers outcome where like I said I thought the Sixers could win but I didn't think they would win in that fashion and another surprising outcome would definitely have to be that Rockets Warriors game from um, from yesterday at the 5 o'clock hour I mean I, I, I said in the last podcast that the Warriors are going to be a team even though they're not playing that well even though they don't necessarily have the, the players and the talent they're a team that's going to play hard it was in Golden State at the Chase Center and and this is the kind of team where the Warriors, could, I mean not the Warriors, the Rockets couldn't take them lightly, or they could get quote unquote embarrassed. Now, losing 
to an, another NBA team as an NBA team is not embarrassing in my opinion. They're all professionals. Any given any given day, any given night, a team can a team can be beat. No, like I said, no one goes undefeated, so it's not that surprising. But when you look at it as who they were, who you, when you match them up player for player, you're like the Warriors shouldn't even be on the court with the Rockets, and they showed them uh, maybe maybe we should. I mean the. They got it. it was a nice balanced effort from the Warriors. Everybody on their team, or oh, every, everyone that started, excuse me, scored in double figures. Um, Damian Lee had 22 and 15. D'Lo had 20 points. Um, Draymond had has one of his best offensive games of the season, if not his his best, with 20 points. Two huge threes there in the fourth. He scored 16 of his 20 in the second half, I believe. Uh, Glenn Robinson the third had 18. Um, call us on chipped in with 10 and it was just one of those things where they they did a pretty good job of corralling and um containing if you will James Harden I mean he only shot the ball 18 times which is which is nothing for him especially just in recent weeks he's he's he shoots more than that in the sleep almost but yeah he only had 24 points but they just good job of just getting the ball out of his hands and forcing the Rockets to go four on three and unfortunately the Rockets just couldn't take advantage I mean Russ Russ didn't have it last night in terms of his shot. He started out good early, but um, as the game went on, his he his shot kind of faulted. He couldn't hit any threes. He went 0 for 8 from three, 11 for 32 from the game. Ended up with 30 points, but it wasn't it wasn't um, it wasn't as efficient of a 30 as as you would hope for. Um, Daniel House five for 15, five for 12 from three. The Rockets as a team shot 16 to 51, only 31 percent from three, and that's just I mean, their team's going to shoot a lot, but when they're not making them, it kind of, it can, things like this can happen where they can, they can lose to a Golden State team. I mean, yeah, they shot overall, not even just from three, overall they shot 37% from the field for the game. And that's like, like I said, even with some of the, even with some of the injuries and the players being out that, that the Warriors had, they clearly had a great game plan. I mean, they've played the Rockets so many times over the years, even though, it's this time there's different personnel. It's just, the the Rockets offense, I believe, is not that different. It's still very James Harden centric and then when he's not going it's and the point guards, whether that was Chris Paul in the past or with or Russell this year. And it might actually play better into their hands because Russell's a little bit more of an ins- inconsistent shooter, at least he has been in recent years, than Chris Paul was. So that that probably so then usually not even including that, they played against um <laughs> Russ and the Thunder a lot. The Warriors have two, so they kind of, kind of just can, can combine those two game plans, put them into one, and they, and it worked out to their favor. So yeah, like I said, that was a game that I definitely, I, I know I was definitely surprised to see it was close late, let alone that the Warriors were able to pull it out. But I think the Rockets were definitely kind of surprised, and and you would think if you're a Rockets fan, hopefully that kind of lights the fire, lets them know like, hey, the even against bad teams, you can't just go out there roll the ball and expect you're going to win. These are professionals at the end of the day, whether. There used to be G League alums where they're undrafted guys, whoever. These guys are still professionals, so it's going to be hard to win every night in the league. So, like I said, hopefully the Rockets can use this as um, as fuel to, to to get to get themselves back on page and get going for the rest of the season. Because this isn't this isn't a game that as a perennial championship contender you should be losing. But like I said, all the top teams have had losses to bad teams this year quote-unquote bad teams this year so this isn't this is nothing new but like i said i told i, I tried to tell the rockets to be, don't 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 sleep on them and and i'm not gonna say they slept on them but i know th- this is definitely not the outcome they thought they were gonna have on christmas day so that was surprising um the early game celtics raptors that was less surprising just because the raptors came in a little banged up i mean they're missing marcus all they're missing siakam they're missing with norman powell with um, Siakam, that's their best player, their best scorer. Powell's been a good contributor. Um, Gasol's a guy who can who can help down low, get some rebounds, um, play some good defense in the post. Probably would have helped on Ennis Cantor, who came out and had a very good first half. I was happy for him just because this was his first time being able to play outside the country since all the political stuff happened with him. So that was just cool for him to be able to play on Christmas Day and also in a foreign in a foreign country, just for him, just so like I was happy for him in that regard, and he played, played pretty well, played pretty well. Definitely gave the Celtics key key minutes. He finished with um, twelve re- uh, twelve points, eleven rebounds off the bench. So exactly what you want from Madison type. But I mean, 
he wasn't a, he definitely wasn't a star. He was definitely the Jalen Brown show. A little Kemba too, but Jalen Brown, he had 30 points, made five threes. Him and Kemba both made five threes. They're the, they're the first teammates to do that. There were five plus threes on Christmas Day, I believe. Um, yeah, and then Jalen Brown also with his 30 points was the youngest to score 30 on Christmas Day as a Celtics. That was a, this was a definitely, I mean, he's been pretty good this year. But this is definitely like if you if you're if you're a person who hasn't watched too too much of the Celtics this year, this is definitely you're like oh wow okay so Jalen Brown has taken that next step and has done what you would hope he could have done coming off of last year where you thought he could take this step but he didn't and for whatever reason that is but yeah he's up to his he's up to his points by over by seven he's shooting he's shooting better from free throw seventy five percent shooting thirty nine percent from three which is better than last year. He's shooting 51% from the field. So he's definitely, so he definitely used this game and he's as used this season to show people like, hey, yeah, I was ready to take that next step. I don't want to, I'm not going to blame it on Kyrie or, or or give credit to Kim or whatever. Maybe he just worked on his game this off season and clearly is paying dividends so far. So I'm happy I'm happy for him. That was good for him. And this, this was a, another win just for Boston to show people like, yeah, no, we're going to be, we might not be the Bucks, but we're going to be a team that's going to be tough to deal with. And like I said, even with, even with the injuries, the Raptors came out. They came out scorching. Of course, scored ten quick points, and then from there, the Celtics decided, like, okay, let's start playing now. And then from there, they kind of just turned the switch, and then they they went on 29, 28 to nine run to take the take a nine point lead after the one, and just never really looked back. Which I mean, like I said, that was a that was a big win for them. They hadn't they had lost eight straight in Toronto, I believe. I think like Jalen Brown, the little clip that went viral a little bit, has, was talking about how he never won in his career in Toronto. So that was a big win for them. The also just not only against the Celtics, but the Raptors had won thirty four straight home games against their division. So that's like Nets, Knicks, Celtics, Sixers. Like teams who just for whatever reason have had troubles playing in Toronto. So this was just a big win just for that, just so that the Celtics could get that monkey off their back. Like, hey, this is a place that we can go into. We can win. Like I said, the team, the Raptors were banged up. So this is not the team that they would, in theory, be facing later on in the year or maybe even in the playoffs but this is like I said still a big win still a big performance this is Christmas day everybody's watching your first game of the day you're setting the tone for the day and this Celtics definitely did that and to wrap the wrap the Christmas day games up you had Nuggets Pelicans which is one who the Pelicans that come into this game they were, they were hot winning seven, or seven in a row I believe and the person who I thought would need to have a big game in order for the Pelicans to get it done had the big game. I mean, Brandon Ingram came out. He's having he's been having a great year, and it's unfortunate that this game was on at ten thirty because not everybody may have been up. But if you did stay up, as I did to watch this one, he he was great. Thirty one points, seven threes, a career high. He like I said, he was great. He 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 showed that like yes, I I am one of if not the most improved players in the league. I can I can walk I can get twenty five thirty a night. Any night doesn't really matter who the opponent is. Did it very efficiently, only eleven of eighteen shooting. So it was just a great night for him. Drew Hottie chipped in twenty points. He had sixteen from Josh Hart off the bench, fifteen from JJ Reddick, who I believe scored thirteen in the second quarter, which were which was big to help to help uh Give the Pelicans the lead. He hit the three right at the buzzer to give them the lead, heading into halftime. So that was big. And they actually have they're actually two and zero against the Nuggets this year, which is which you would think the Nuggets have been one of the better teams in the league. So that this that's kind of surprising, but for whatever reason, Pelicans have had their number. And um, so yeah, it was a great performance by them. Obviously, like the Nuggets, like I said, they were coming. They came in pretty hot, so people thought that the Nuggets should be able to handle them. The Pelicans have been struggling reeling a little bit this year, but for whatever reason. This team just matches up well with them. I don't know what it is, but they were just able to find a way to. They were able to find a way to hold on. Yoka, she shot you know, eight for twenty, only had twenty three. Jamal Murray couldn't really do anything. Eight and only had eight points. Gary Harris was all right. Paul Millsap didn't score at all. So like they are just for whatever reason their defense just matched, matches up very well against the Nuggets. So like I said, this is not maybe a team that they're going to face in the playoffs, which is something I have to figure out how to work through because other teams will look at what the Pelicans have tried to do against the Nuggets and see if what they can work on and what what kind of things they can throw at them to see if that will help them out. So it will be interesting to see how the Nuggets bounce back from this one. But like I said, um, good teams in the league lose to, lose to the, quote, 
um, bad teams. It did happen, so this isn't this isn't that surprising. It was just it was just I I figured if they Pelicans would have to get this job get the job done, Brandon was gonna have to have a night, and he had a night. So and sometimes you just get beat, and that's just how the Nuggets. That's how the Nuggets, and this is what happened with the Nuggets. And like I said, it was a great overall great day. All the games were entertaining in different ways. The, the last couple, the last few games were close, so the, the, I was definitely what you hope for. You you don't want to come get to this game with some of the best teams in the league and get a bunch of blowouts. But yeah, I know the NBA has probably got to be happy with the way that the games played out. Um, the only thing we've got, like I said, we've got to monitor that LeBron injury. That's really the, one of the biggest things coming out of Christmas Day is just like what happens with him. But I don't think it's too too serious. But I I wouldn't be surprised if he sits out some games. But yeah, so from going from the great, the best teams, and some of the biggest games in the NBA, we're going to we're going to transition over to the biggest game in college football. And right after this break, we're going to talk about the college football playoff semifinal games coming up this Saturday. Whew, those are going to be some good ones. We'll talk about them after the break. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. GSMC Sports Podcast, presented by GSMC Podcast Network. Um, so yeah, so like I said, we're, we're going to talk about the college football playoff games, and like I said, there both of these games should be entertaining for different reasons. But this this first one, this Clemson Ohio State game, I mean, there's a there's a chance this could be the game of the year. I mean, obviously you have two of the best teams in the country, but you have two of the top offenses, two of the top defenses going head to head, and it's just it seems it just has the makings to be a great game. I mean, both of these teams, this, this, this is the best offense they will have faced all year. It's the best defense they will have faced all year. Clemson's coming in hot. I mean, it started off a little rough early in the year. I mean, I would say they won all their games, but it started off a little rough. Trevor Lawrence looked like he was having a sophomore slump, but he's been great the last six games. I believe he's gone like 20 touchdowns, no interceptions the last six games. Um, Justin Fields in Ohio State, they've been great all year. Um, He's 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 been great. He made a great decision transferring over to Ohio State, clearly, because he made the college football playoff and Georgia did not, unfortunately for them. But he he's clearly made the right decision coming here. His offense has been great for him. Um, he's he's got forty touchdown passes, one interception. He just he's been a machine. Doesn't turn the ball over. Added ten rushing touchdowns, I believe. He's been great. But yeah, like I said, on paper, these these teams match up. These teams match up great. It's, um, Ohio State's first in points, third in points allowed, and second in total yards allowed. So, like I said, their offense has been great. Their defense has been great. You could question some of the teams they've played, but they've played three ranked teams to end the season. Or they've played, yeah, they've played a couple of ranked teams towards the end of the season in Penn State, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Now, people talk about how the Big Ten's not that good or how some of those teams have are on the Cowboy of Clemson, which are not. But at the same time, you beat who's on your schedule, and all the ranked teams Ohio State's gone up against, they beat them, and some of them they beat pretty easily. I mean, they beat Wisconsin handily earlier in the year. The Big Ten Championship game was a little bit more of a fight, which, I mean, you would expect the second time around, but still, they were able to get that out. They, like, the, the Michigan didn't have, didn't, couldn't do anything with them. And then the Penn State game was close, but that was more so because they, they had a couple turnovers there in the second half, and also the, Will Levis backup quarterback energy that kind of some teams kind of have that momentum they they get when their quarterback gets hurt and they in the backup starts to make a couple plays, but yeah so they're they've been great all year they got playmakers all over 
like I said, Justin Fields, J.K. Dobbins, one of the best running backs in the country this year, depending on who you ask. Um, they've got they've got experienced guys on the outside and um, K.J. Hill, um, Benjamin Victor, um, uh, what's uh, Austin Mack? Who's uh, not? Yeah, Austin Mack who's it? Yeah, no, no, uh, yeah, Austin Mack who's a senior. Chris Olave, who's only a sophomore, and he's been great for them this year. They had a good old line, and obviously that doesn't even. And then flip sides, I mean, they got elite talent on the defensive line. Chase Young, obviously, who's the best, who could have and maybe should have won the husband, depending on who you ask. I, I still believe Joe Burrow, like that, like that decision made sense. But I would not have argued if you gave it to Chase Young. He's been dominant, sixteen and a half sacks this year. Though he hasn't, he didn't have any last two games against Michigan and Wisconsin. But a lot of that stemmed from teams deciding that they're not going to let. Um, Chase Young wrecked the game, which is, I mean, in my opinion, very smart. I don't, I don't want, I would never block that guy one on one if I was an offensive coach. Teams have done it; they failed at doing so. But I just one thing: if I'm, if I'm them, I'm not. Chase Young is seeing chips and double teams. I mean, triple teams if I can. I'm, there's no way I'm letting Chase Young destroy the, my my offensive game plan. I, I assume that's what Clemson is going to do. They, um, they have. A very good secondary with Jeff Okuda, who's going to be top ten pick, probably the first corner on the board. Depending, I mean, this is this it's a little early to to make decisions on the draft, so just because everybody you don't never really know at this point. Do people rise, people fall, kind of thing. And also, I guess we'll see how he plays this week because he's going to have some touch map touch mat, tough matchups. Excuse me, on the outside, you got um Sean Wade, who's been their slot corner, who's been very good. Another guy who, if he decides to come out. Could very well be a top top fifty selection go in the first second round. The other corner, Damon Arnett, he's been he's been good this year. Obviously, it's it's hard when you're when you have one of if not the best corner in the country on your on your on your on your team. Everyone's going to panel in comparison. But they've like they said their secondary has been great. They they don't give up that many points. They don't give up that many yards. Like I said, they're not haven't faced an offense as good as Clemson. Obviously, this year they haven't faced receivers as good as. T. Higgins, who's another guy that's going to go in the first round, most likely, which we will well, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, just with some of these prospects. Um, and then, like, uh, Justin Ross, they haven't faced a quarterback like Trevor Lawrence. Well, this would be an interesting match because Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, they've been battling ever since their high school days. So, it just, it's, it was only, it's only, it's only right that they battle again on the, on the, on the big stage of college football. And, they got that. They got um, Travis Etienne on that offense. Like I said, like I already mentioned, Trevor Lawrence, who's like I said, who started off a little slow, but it's been great the last six games, and that's kind of what you want heading right into the playoffs. You want to get hot at the right time, and Clemson's definitely doing that. Um, and then on defensively, they have they have Isaiah Simmons, who I who I would expect is going to be in charge of spying Justin Fields, making sure that when when their coverage holds up on the back end for Clemson that they're not going to let Justin Fields get out there and run around. I think Isaiah Simmons, it would make sense to have him be the guy to, to kind of keep an eye on him. And I, and I mean, we'll see what Brent Venables, Venables decides to do, but that'd be my plan. But obviously again, he's a national championship winning defensive coach. So I'm not going to tell him, I'm not going to tell him how to do his job, but I'm just saying that's what I would do. See what they do. But yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because you can't let Justin Fields, that's the one thing he's been good at this year is just when when the play breaks down, when nobody's open, he'll tuck it around, and he usually outruns whoever the spies that you have. So you gotta gotta find a way to keep him in the pocket, and you gotta find a way to make sure that whoever the spy is is fast enough to run with him at least, if not very much running down. And I mean, Isaiah Simmons is a freak athlete, six four, like two thirty, supposed to be a track star. I mean, it's that that'll be that'd be interesting matchup just to see how many. How um just to see him try to run down Justin Fields and I, I assume he will a couple times but yeah that game like I said that game's gonna be great I I expect that one like I said I expect it to be one of if not the game of the year in college football just these teams are just so evenly matched on paper I, it's it's hard for me to feel like any team's gonna get an edge though I think Clemson may a little bit have the edge with the experience the championship experience with all these most of these guys if not all these guys that are playing were a part of or played on the team. Last year, that won the national championship and just destroyed Alabama in the championship game. So they're used to the moment; they'll be ready for the moment. You would think, but then I don't know something about that new factor in that just that that fresh, that fresh, um, that fresh belief in Ohio State, where 
I know they haven't been there, but sometimes that you the stage doesn't get too big because you haven't been there. So that that can kind of that can both be a detriment and also can be a benefit. Um, but yeah, that should like I said, it's gonna be a great game. I I, I as much as Clemson, I think is gonna. I mean, Dab was gonna play up the undercard underdog card with his team, just because people have kind of doubted Clemson all year, have talked up LSU, have talked up Ohio State all year, just talked about oh. Clemson doesn't beat anybody. Oh, they look they look sluggish. They almost lost in North Carolina, all that stuff. But I mean, that was a coach that's been here, done it before. Trevor Lawrence is a quarterback that's been here and done it before as a freshman. So I would like to think he wouldn't he wouldn't be more nervous as a sophomore. But you never know. Like I said, this is a this is gonna be a great game. I still find it. Like I said, the Ohio State is with two, in my opinion, just to give a pick. Ohio State is too well balanced on offense and defense. That I think they they should find a way to edge it out. Like I said, it's going to be close. When I don't think either team's going to blow anybody out. But if Clemson if, if Clemson gets a great day out of Trevor Lawrence, uh, I think that oh, Ohio State's in trouble. So that's that would be my key. Is if can Chase Young get to Trevor Lawrence? Because if he can, then I think Ohio State has a good shot at winning. If he doesn't, and Trevor Lawrence has all day to find T Higgins and Justin Ross and Amari Rodgers in the slot and ETN out the backfield, I think Ohio State's going to be in for a long day. Even with like I said, they got great corners. But these guys are huge on the outside, and and just that that pure size, just that ability to jump over your corners and make a play on the ball, is something that Trevor Lawrence I think will take advantage of, and Clemson will try to take advantage of. And if Ohio State has no answer for that, could be a long night. I'm flipping over to the other game, not to, like I said, not not to blow this game off, but this game should be good for different reasons in the LSU. Oklahoma, and I think this one's going to be an offensive shootout. This could very well emulate a a Big Twelve game that Oklahoma is used to, just because not that not that LSU doesn't doesn't have good players on defense. I mean, they got if not if I mean I mean they have technically the the best defensive back in the country. He, um, Grant Delp with their safety won the Jim Thorpe Award, though. I mean, you could have given it to Derek Stingley, the freshman on the on the on the. On the on the team, he has six interceptions as a freshman. I mean, he's one of, if not the best corner, probably him and Okuda, are the two best corners in the country. And like I said, he's a freshman, so I'd be crazy. But they'll be him and then Christian Fulton. On the other side, be they'll be matched up against Ceedee Lamb, which will which should be. I mean, that'll just be an amazing, amazing matchup. Just to just to see, just I mean, NFL prospects all over the all over the place. Just NFL matchups all over the place, and just to see. I mean, Oklahoma. For their own right, I mean, LSU's been great. They have the Heisman Trophy winner. They have two thousand-yard receivers in Jamar Chase, who has eighteen hundred yards, I believe. He has eighteen hundred yards this season. No, fourteen hundred yards. My my bad. Eighteen touchdowns. That's what it was. Fourteen, almost fifteen hundred yards. Eighteen touchdowns. Tied an SEC record for touchdowns. You got Justin Jefferson, who's got twelve hundred yards and fourteen touchdowns in those in his own right. So. Like they are going to present a challenge for that Oklahoma defense, especially defense that who's going to be without their best pass rusher in Ronnie Perkins, who leads the team in sacks, who's suspended for this game. So that'll that that's I mean it was already they are already going to be in trouble. But that's going to hurt them even more just not having him out there. And then, like I said, you're going up against an offense who has, for the most part, I mean. Or looked unstoppable. I mean, you could say. I mean, I don't. Know, I can think of another word. It's just that like they, they, Joe Burrow just found a way to get the ball exactly where it needs to be. Whenever, where, whenever it needs to be there, their receivers go up and make plays over anybody. Though the one thing that will be interesting to look at is their running back Clyde Edwards. Hilaire is nursing a hamstring injury. Just to sort of see, I believe it's going to be a game time decision. So to see if he plays and see how effective he is will definitely be important because he's been a very big part. Of their offense this year, he's got um he's got almost thirteen hundred yards and sixteen touchdowns on the ground, and obviously he had the breakout day against Alabama. So it'll be interesting to see what their offense will look like without him out there. They're still gonna have their receivers, still gonna have Joe Burrow, so it it shouldn't be that big of a deal. But just be interesting to see how that how they look. And then obviously on the other side, a touch on CeeDee Lamb, a little, but Jalen Hurts. I mean, he's a guy that's been here, been on the stage before, and with Alabama, it's not gonna be too big for him. I would think they have a great offense in their own right. I mean, the, 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 they are definitely no slouch. Let me. I don't want to. I know I've I've never talked about how great that um the LSU offense is, but they're second in yards to LSU. 
with over 500 yards of total offense a game. Um, he first was the Heisman runner-up. He has 51 touchdowns on the season, over 1,200 rushing yards, averaging 11, oh, almost 12 yards per attempt. So they are they're good in their own right. Have uh, have have guys that have guys in the coach in Lincoln Riley that has it just seems to be able to get offense out of anybody. I mean, he can score on it seems any defense out there. So they're definitely not going to – I mean, I know LSU has dominated just just about all the teams they've played. I mean, they're 13-point, almost 14-point favorites in this game, so they expect it to be another dominating performance. But um, I'm just saying if Joe Burrow – I don't expect the lights to be too bright for him, but if he has an early turnover, they have a fumble or something, like Oklahoma should be able to put up some points. I mean, that, that LSU defense, though it's only given up 17 points combined in the last two weeks, like they're, they've been susceptible to – Big plays, and I mean, just look at that Alabama game. Alabama had no issue going up and down the field on them. It was, it was their defense that had the issues, but I mean, that's how the ball's a little bit banged up. But yes, yeah, this should be a team that's, and, the, and Oklahoma should be a team that's going to be able to put up points against them. So, I mean, like I said, LSU hasn't had a problem winning shootouts against anybody, but it'll be interesting to see if they get like a couple of the turnovers that they start off a little slow. If Oklahoma gets a big lead, will they be able to catch up? Just because, like I said, um, like I said, LSU, great secondary, but they have been able to get you have been able to get big plays on them. They the Oklahoma has a guy in C D Lamb who could very well be the first or a second receiver taken in the draft. So it's not it's not they have slouches out there on offense for Oklahoma. So like I said, this game I believe while the first game should be more of a little bit closer of a defensive battle, still teams should probably get into the thirties, but if this will be more that will be more of a defensive game, this has the makings of an offensive shootout, which I mean, you get to pick your poison. If you're a defensive guy, that LSU, I mean, that Ohio State Clemson game is definitely the one for you. If you're a guy that, if you're a person that just loves offense, I mean, I think this Clemson, uh, not Clemson, wow, um, this LSU Oklahoma game is the one you should tune in for. Because, I mean, both those, like I said, both of them are going to be great in their own regards, but this one, I think, has all the makings of a potential shootout, which should be fun, which should definitely be fun. And and like I said, for college football fans, this this is going to be a great weekend in terms of these games. And if you're not a college football fan, but you're an NFL guy and you're looking for some NFL talent to help your team out, the, this weekend's also going to be great for you because, like I said, there will be NFL prospects all over the field in both games. And I'll tell you some guys to watch out for here after the break. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. season hasn't gone as well as you hoped it would go, and you're on the lookout for some prospects to help your team, whether it's quarterback, receiver, running back, I mean, these. The, I would tell you to tune in this weekend, this Saturday, for these two games, because they're going to be NFL prospects everywhere, at all levels, <laughs> at all levels of on the field, and it starts, and like I said, I'll start with the Start first with the LSU Oklahoma game. I mean, you, there's the obvious ones. We have Joe Burrow. If you're if you're if you're a quarterback needy team, whether because I'm you've quarterback needy team, whether that's the Bengals, whether that's Dolphins, what's going to be up there? Um, no, the Giants probably won't. If you're like if the Chargers decide to trade up, they need a they need a quarterback. Um, if the Bucks decide they want to move on for Jameis, they could need. I mean, the Bucks won't be as high, but there's different teams that 
um, could you definitely need a quarterback. Joe Burrow is a guy that you should definitely watch out for. I mean, he's he's been great all season, won the Heisman. So there's no reason to think he should falter in this game. But even just if it's not this game, then definitely tune in. If they may win this game, go to the national championship. That'll be a good one because he's going to face either a great defense in Ohio State or a great defense in Clemson. So that'll be I'll be a big test for him just to see how he does against some NFL caliber talent. And then like I like I mentioned before, you got CD Lamb. He won the outside, has twelve hundred yards, fourteen touchdowns, one of the best receivers in the country. Going to be one of the best receivers at heading into NFL draft. I mean, obviously, we'll touch more on the draft around the combine time and stuff to give a more give a more detailed um, deep dive into the, these con- these these prospects. But I'm just giving you some overview. And CD Lamb's definitely going to be a guy if you're a Ward virus receiving any team, whether that's if there's Eagles fans out there. I know you guys. I know they definitely. I've had their struggles at the wide receiver position this year, so that this is the guy I would tell you to watch out for. Um, um, on the other side with that receiver, Justin Jefferson is another guy who who's coming out this year that could that's going to help a team. I mean, he may not go as high as CeeDee Lamb, but like I said, the draft is so unpredictable. People now, I mean, at this time two years ago, they didn't buy think Baker Mayfield was going to go number one. Probably not at this time last year. Damn, I think Daniel Jones was going to go number six. Probably not, but like I said, these things happen. So it's just it's just good to keep your eye out on as many props as you can if you're a team that is looking for certain positions. And like I said, Justin Jefferson's another guy on um, on the LSU defense. You got the Grant Delpit, who I said, who I mentioned before, won the Jim Thorpe Award for best defensive back in the land, even though they could have gone to. A couple other guys on his team, but he's been a great safety over his career. He got that number seven, which is usually given to the the best player on the LSU defense. So you know, you know he's pretty good. You have to know he's pretty good if they they don't just let anybody wear that number. So he's been great. I mean, at corner, Christian Fulton, another corner is coming out. Who who's going to be? Who's definitely going to be one of the top corners coming out? So if you're a team that in need of some corner help, whether that's the Eagles again. Yeah, the Eagles. The Eagles. Let me put it this way: If you're an Eagles fan, tune into these games because there's going to be players that you could very well be seeing on Sundays <laughs> on your team very soon. So whether you're an Eagles guy, whether you're, say, like a team like the Giants that they decide to trade down, they could use some outside corner help. Um, yeah, you know, just different. A couple different teams that that can that they may need they may need some guys in the back end. Those there's a couple guys to look out for. Um, like I say Clyde edwards alaire if he plays. He's a running back. Probably not going to go too, too high, but he's had good performances in the past against in big-time games. So another big-time performance, whether it's this game or the national championship game, will definitely be big for him in terms of um, helping his draft stock. If you're looking for a linebacker, uh, Kenneth Murray out of Oklahoma, he'll be big just in terms of stopping the run and helping to stop some of those underneath passes and maybe even pressuring Joe Burrow, getting him off the spot, making his life uncomfortable back there. He could be very important as a guy if you're if you're a team that needs a linebacker. He's a guy to look out for. And um, Neville Gallimore, I believe is how you pronounce his name. He's an interior defensive lineman, D tackle kind of guy. So he's another guy that you, if you're looking if your team is in need of some pass rush help, especially up the middle, he could be a guy that that could that, that could be well, someone you might want to keep your eye on just in terms of just see how you can push the pocket, and make Joe Burrow like I said, like I said, move off the spot, make him uncomfortable because. No quarterback likes pressure up the middle just because it's right by their legs. It, it causes them to have to drop back further, kind of move off of where they go, get their eyes um, away from looking downfield and stuff like that. So he'll be he'll be important not only in the game but also just an important guy to keep an eye on if you're a team in need of um, – if you're a team needs to be line help. And then jumping over to that Clemson-Ohio State game, I mean, there's – I mean, there's guys that aren't even going to be able to come out that are that are going to be on that game, which that people are going to have their eyes on. But obviously, you have the big guys and Chase Young, who is, I mean, has been as good as any player in the league this year. Could very well go number one if the Bengals decide that. Yeah, you know what? Let's keep Andy Dalton around for another year. Which I mean, they might, they might not. You never know. But and then obviously, he's a guy that's in Ohio already at Ohio State. I mean, Joe Burrow is from Ohio, went to Ohio State too. So. They have their options out there, but he's a guy that I think teams teams will. If the Bengals don't want a quarterback, well, if the Bengals, if the Bengals, even if the Bengals do want a quarterback, I mean, there are going to be teams trying to trade up for Chase Young, and as they should. I mean, he's been a dominant pass rusher since he got to Ohio State. He's been a dominant. He's been the best pass rusher, best player, defensive player, maybe even just player overall in the country this year. So 
he's a guy, I mean, everybody knows about him, but also just it would be interesting to see because he's going to go up against some better teams. Like I said, he hasn't doesn't have any sacks his last two games to just kind of see how um, different teams scheme for him and see how he handles that. Uh, it'll be big for him. Um, also, like I mentioned earlier, Jeff Okuda, the corner, he's been – one of the best corners in the league, um, in the country. I mean, teams just don't even throw it at him that much. It's because they're just like, yeah, and I'm not. Why even waste my time? It's not. It's not going to get completed. And it may even get picked off, so it's not even worth it. So he he's a guy that if you're a quarterback needy team, he'll he'll um um he's he's definitely a guy I would keep my eye on, and he'll be going up against some good receivers like T Higgins, who he should be matched up on throughout diff- throughout different periods of the game. I know I would try if I'm Miles Adams trying to get my best corner on their best receiver, so. He, that'll be a great, great matchup because that's the kind of NFL type that he's going to be going up against. Maybe not, maybe not, not everyone's that big as D. Higgins is, but if he can handle that, then you would think, all right, that's definitely good steps because D. Higgins is the guy that's going to go probably in the first round, one of the top three, four wide receivers taken. So that that, that kind of that matchup is going to be great. I mentioned already how Isaiah Simmons, the linebacker, safety hybrid kind of guy. He's going to be very. He, like I said, Clemson wins. And the defense stops the Ohio State offense. He's going to have to have a big game just containing Justin Fields and stopping J.K. Dobbins. So he's he's another guy who just who's um, who you're going to want to keep your eye on if you're if you're a team that's in need of a playmaker just on defense, whether that's at safety at linebacker. No one really knows for certain what position he's going to be. I mean, he's a big guy, six four, so he's probably going to be a linebacker, but he could very well be a strong safety that can do both play in the box and play out and play up and play out high. But yeah, he's a, he's a guy that I think could very well be a top ten, top team fifteen kind of pick just because of guys like Derwin James coming up before him who were play a similar who played a similar type of position just kinda of all over. I mean he's a little bit bigger I think in terms of just pure like muscle and size than those guys were. He's very well put together. But he's a guy that because of the success of those kind of guys, the team's gonna be willing to Take it not take a chance. He's very good, but draft him higher, just because like the the league's going to more spread offenses, more fast players. You need better athletes out there on defense to be able to keep up. And he's the kind of he's kind of that new new prototypical linebacker you would want a guy that can run, or a guy that can cover, that kind of can kind of do it all. Has a size, everything. So he's a guy that definitely keep your eye on. And mention the running backs, J.K. Dobbins, um, Travis Etienne on both sides. Those are guys who have been great their whole college careers and those teams have been known, I mean especially Ohio State, they've been known for producing some good running backs like Zeke in the past so that might help boost his stock and ETN, I mean Goldman hasn't had the success in the pros that he had in college but I think ETN was a little bit better than he was coming out I mean he's just like, he's a big play waiting to happen every time he gets the ball so if you're a team, especially seeing as a couple teams like the Raiders or the Eagles, who have taken, or even even other teams in the past, whether it's the Panthers or the Cowboys, um, Vikings this year, the Jaguars. Then he um, Fortnite helped them a little bit. That yeah, they went to the AFC Championship game. But they've been a little sputtering since then. But we've seen it's a Saquon and the Giants. You've seen running backs come into the league and be great from the start. So that that might be what gets people to maybe like quote unquote overdraft running backs. And before it was like, oh, don't take a running back high. You can get them later. Blah blah blah. But some of these high draft, I mean, some of these later guys too have been great, but some of these high draft picks have been well worth it. So you might as well get them while they're still young, they're still fresh. So for those coming guys, and also a couple of the receivers I mentioned earlier, whether it's KJ Hill, Victor, Austin Mack, the older receivers who maybe not may not have the production of guys like Jerry Judy or Henry Ruggs, Devontae Smith, C.D. Lamb, T. Higgins, those kind of guys, but because of the success of guys like Tamar Gloran in the last year who only had like 30, 40 catches, only like 700 yards, 11 touchdowns, but didn't have that many yards, or didn't have that, didn't have the eye-popping stats, but has been great from the moment he stepped in to, to the league with Washington. Guys like Michael Thomas, who maybe didn't have the most gaudy stats in college, but has come to the league, lit up on fire. He's been the best receiver in like the first four seasons of his career, just set the receiving yard, um, receptions record for a season. I mean, the, that kind of factory where you have guys that have come out and been productive, especially early in their career, that might get you to take a look at like, hey, okay, whatever they're doing down there, however they're coaching about their wide receivers, it's clearly something's translating. So let me maybe take a chance and draft these guys a little bit higher. So if you're 
if you're a wide receiver needy team, obviously like you're looking at the the LSU offense or the Oklahoma or Clemson guys, when understandably so. But these Ohio State guys may be guys that rise up the draft boards in um in 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 the coming months just because of you watch their you watch their film and maybe they haven't been asked to do too much, but whatever they do things and they pop out on tape and on and in games that and you notice things, you're like, oh wow, okay, maybe I should take a look at these guys. And the same thing, like I said with Terry McLaurin, I mean, he was he wasn't a big, well known prospect when when the draft process, all that stuff started last year. But he's coming and been arguably the best rookie receiver, even a guy, and even yeah, no, you yeah, know, he's been arguably the best rookie receiver in my opinion. So either that these Ohio State's definitely gonna be a team that people are gonna look at just to see like, oh, maybe we should check out their pipeline, and see see what we can pick from in their wide receiver core. So, like I said, even if you're not a big college football guy, if you're more of an NFL guy, then these games are still for you just because there's going to be NFL process players that are going to be playing on Sundays very soon all over the field in both of those games and other games throughout the college football bowl games as well. But these two games are going to are littered, littered with NFL prospects. So, if I were you, and if you're a team that's, and if you're going to be on the lookout to see some guys that you may, you may very well see on your team very soon, I would tune in. So, so yeah, so that's that's how I, that's how I feel about that. And also, so coming in next, we're going to go transition from players that are going to be playing on Sundays in the in are going to be playing on Saturday in a playoff. The players that could be playing that are going to be playing on Sundays that could be in the playoffs very soon. I mean, it's the last week of the season. NFL playoff picture is still kind of a little murky. There's still some decisions and um, seeds that have to be that have to be decided, and we're going to touch on those and how they may shape out right after this. Are you looking to get your college football fixed? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. We are back here on GSMC Sports. So as I was saying, I mean, the AFC, we'll start with the AFC. The AFC is a little bit more locked in, just in terms of who's going to be where. Like, there really, there's only one seed that you're trying to, uh, that they're that you're going to be deciding. And it's just really the sixth seed. Everybody else is at least locked into the playoffs. Not, not locked into their seed, but locked into the playoffs. So, we know the Baltimore is going to have the one seed already. They locked that up last week, so they're not going to be playing anybody. But the two seed still up for grabs. It could go to uh, right now. The Patriots have, and all they need to do is win or tie against the Dolphins, and they get it. But Kansas City could see that two seed if they beat the Chargers, which which they could. But you know, teams this late in the season they like to play spoiler, so you never you never want to assume things. And soon teams are going to get the win, but in Kansas City plays the Chargers, so they win, and New England loses, and they're the two seed, which could be big because though the the Patriots are usually always have at least at least a, the buy of not home field advantage, so having to go and potentially win two world playoff games in Kansas City and in Baltimore would be would be a tough ask for them. Even even though I know they have Tom Brady, they have Belichick. That's great. That's great. But I'm just saying these these new guys. I mean, they've already lost to them once. They've already lost the Chiefs and the and the Ravens during the regular season. It doesn't seem like these young quarterbacks are as afraid of the mystique of the Patriots ever since. Um, I think I think that Nick Foles Super Bowl helped that. I mean, obviously they dominated the Rams last year, so it's it's, it's not exactly the same. But when you can see that they can be beaten, they're not 
they're not um they're not completely imp- um, impenetrable in terms of being able to defeat them. Uh, the, these I think that some of these young quarterbacks aren't going to be scared to go and play the Patriots, especially especially they get them at home. So the Patriots got to win that game against the Dolphins. The Dolphins have been playing hard, but obviously all every game is a, a must win in my opinion because you never you don't want to lose a game. But this is very big just, just to make sure. Patriots get the week off, have the bye, have time to game plan for whoever it is, and at least at the very least get one home playoff game before the end AFC Championship game. And then they got to go to Baltimore again. All right, it's one game for a Super Bowl. You 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 hope you put your money on Brady and Belichick, but like I said having to win two two road playoff games to get the Super Bowl that is definitely not the ideal situation for Patriots. And then yeah, the Texans locked to the four seed, even though. They haven't really, they haven't really decided whether they're going to play all their stars or not. I don't think they should. I understand why you would, just because you don't want, you want to keep that, you want to keep your guys fresh, keep that momentum going, heading into the playoffs. But it's like you can't do anything but hurt yourself in terms of guys get hurt. And I understand. Also, well, yeah, in terms of guys getting hurt, you don't want anybody to get hurt heading to the playoffs. But I also have wanting to knock out a division rival. They play the Titans. If the Titans lose, then they they could possibly miss the playoffs. So I understand why they would do it, but. At the same time, I don't think it's worth the risk of of um, of having the of risking of losing players just to make sure the Titans don't get in the playoffs. And also, you're not going to play them at the end of the playoffs. You're locked to the four seed. The Titans are the, the Titans would be the six. So you're playing the Bills regardless. So whether you win or lose this game, that doesn't really change anything. So it's not really it doesn't seem worthwhile to me. But yeah, like I said, with six seed, Steelers can still get it as well. They are going up against, luckily, the Ravens, who, as I said, they're already resting Lamar. They're gonna, um, Mark Ingram, I don't think, is going to play. They're going to rest some other guys. Obviously, you can only rest so many. You don't have that many guys on a roster on game days to play. So you, they can't, they're not going to rest everybody, but they're going to rest their main guys. So that helps the Steelers out definitely, even though um, with the way their quarterbacks have been playing the past couple weeks, they, it might not matter who starts for the Ravens. But that's an important game for the Steelers. they got to win that game. And they need, like I said, they need ten. Um, they need the Titans to lose. I mean, that's the easiest path. There's other paths. They could, they could tie, and and have them lose, or they could have Tennessee lose, Indy win, Oakland lose, and they might get in. There's there's so many different ways that these teams can get in. But long story short, six seeds up for grabs. Pittsburgh wins. Tennessee ties. That's their easiest path. And on you know, the flip side, from Tennessee's perspective, they need to be a team in Tennessee. I mean, in Houston, who they played tough a couple weeks ago, who they who they know very well as division opponent, who may or may not be resting their stars, which would benefit them. So if they just win, they're in. If they tie, they're in. Even though I mean, playing for a tie is, is not is not easy to do, just because there's so many factors that go into getting a tie. But yeah, so Tennessee, Tennessee um, wins there and they tie, and Pittsburgh loses or ties there in, or if Pittsburgh loses and Indy loses, then they're in. So long story short, just win and you're in. And then the Raiders, I mean, the Raiders who many people had left for dead a couple of weeks ago, still still alive, and they only, I mean, they needed they needed five things to happen last weekend in order for them to have a shot. All five of those things happen now this weekend. They need they need to win. Their game against the Broncos they need the Titans to lose. They need the against the Texans, which again, as we touched on, if they play a start, is not impossible. They need the Steelers to lose, who again, um, the Ravens aren't playing the, some of their, their star players, so that's not impossible to have happen. And the Colts to be the Jaguars, who the Colts have been playing better than the Jaguars. The Jaguars are kind of real, and they haven't they haven't that Minshew magic from the beginning of the season hasn't really come back since he came back into the lineup. So all those things are very much possible. And the Raiders could backdoor their way into the playoffs. I mean, they would face either Kansas City or the Patriots. Probably get beat, but that would just be big for just big to have a, be coming off a playoff season while you head into Vegas next year. I mean, that would be big for the Raiders. So, I mean, I would don't be surprised if the Raiders if you see if you see the Raiders sneak into the playoffs just because, like I said, they need a couple things to happen, and all those things aren't out of the realm of possibility. So I could easily see the the um, I see the teams in the AFC like the higher season the AFC try like with the with the Texans and the Ravens if they actually try to win those games like it's easy to see them losing and then I mean they still need to beat the Broncos who've been playing better recently Drew Locks looked pretty good the last couple of games so it's not a foregone conclusion that the Raiders beat the Broncos 
But if they do, don't be surprised if you see them in the playoffs, which would be cool. I mean, just just because I mean they're they just just to see John Gruden back in the playoffs, and obviously just so. I mean, he's been he's been him and Mike Mayock as a GM have been have been talked about in terms of people weren't really sure how it was going to work. So this would be a big step in terms of getting people back on their side, and this would be huge for Derek Carr just because. This season has been very up and down for him. It's been his, his the couple of the last couple of seasons have been very up and down since his back injury that shortened his season. We look like he was uh, he probably wasn't going to win, but he was definitely up there for an MVP candidate. So that would be big for him just to get into the playoffs, actually playing a playoff game, show show people he can lead them. So then they don't they're another team that could be looking to move on at the quarterback position. So this would be big just to prove to the Raiders and the fans and everybody that hey look now I mean to say there's no need for you to make a move. So that's the AFC. The AFC's um, got some spots up for grab and the NFC just I mean there's only see that's locked in is is the Vikings at six. Everyone else is playing for positioning this weekend, whether that's if you start at the four seed in the NFC East because we don't know who's gonna win that one yet. The um the Eagles need to beat the Giants, who's not gonna be an easy out the Giants haven't given up on the season, so it's not gonna be a simple game for them by any stretch. But it's a game in th- I mean, I wanna say in theory they should win. But because of their injuries, especially with Zach Ertz not being out too on top of all the injuries they did have, I mean, they get Jordan Howard back, which should help. But at the same time, they're just banged up. And like I said, the Giants haven't given up. They're still playing hard. Pat Sherman's possibly coaching for his job, which we'll get into in the next segment. So they're not just going to lay down and die. I don't think. No, you never know. We'll see if the Eagles get out to a big lead. What happens with the uh, Giants? But their their team is going to fight, so they could they could the Giants could still get in, the Cowboys could still get in, even though even with their loss last week. I mean, Washington, another team that hasn't completely given up. But I mean, just it's just it'd be hard. It'd be it's hard to tell how the Cowboys are going to come out after their loss last weekend, just to see if they still have that same fight, that same energy to try to get into the playoffs. So they kind of just like sleepwalk through this game and then. Let a Washington team hang around, and then maybe Case Keenum can lead them to lead them to a victory. I mean, obviously, everybody wants to end their season with a win. Dak's still banged up, so we don't really know how that's going to look. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see if Washington can pull it out, and then the Eagles would get in that way. If both teams lose, the Eagles get in. If the Eagles win, they're in. If the Eagles lose and the Cowboys win, then they're in. So the NFC is up for grabs. I mean, the first-round buys and the ones that you just sell for grabs. Green Bay can get it. You need, in order to just get a first-round buy, you just need a win. Or or New Orleans lost. Or some, there's some tie scenarios in there, even though ties aren't that common. But those are the two main ones. In order to get home field, they just need to win and have San Francisco lose or tie. Or if they tie, they need loss from San Francisco and New Orleans, and they get the one seed, which would be big just because no one... I, I would imagine no one wants to go into the cold in Lambeau in January and have to play there. I mean, it's going to be freezing, possibly snowing. No one wants that. Um, the Warrens are still alive for a bye. They just need to win and have Green Bay lose, even though they're playing the Lions. Um, their Lions are reeling at this point, so it's hard to imagine the Packers losing. But any given Sunday, you never know. And the Saints play the Carolina Panthers on the road, but it's a team that they should be able to handle. Kyle Allen, I think they're, no, I think they're back. Will Grish starting now, so he's a rookie. We'll see how he does, but and obviously the Saints still have a lot to play for, so they're not they're not they're not just going to concede this game. So they get the first round by with a win and a Green Bay loss or a win in the San Francisco loss, and then obviously there's, there's some tie scenarios, but that's a little bit more tricky. Or I think they or they also get a first round by if San Francisco loses and Green Bay wins or ties. So there's still a chance and they have an outside chance to the one seed. They can still get it as long as they win and Green Bay loses their ties or San Francisco loses their ties. Then they they get the one seed, or if I guess if Green if New Orleans ties and they would need Green Bay to lose, San Francisco to lose. Very confusing. There's so many scenarios that could happen this week just because n- nothing's really been set in stone. And and obviously the late game, the biggest game of the weekend, the San Francisco Seahawks game. That's I mean that's for, I mean that's very much for the one seed. I mean it's for the division, but it's very much for the could very much be for the one seed if the if San Francisco wins and they win the division, obviously. They get a first round bye if they win, and they clinch home field if they win. So for San Francisco, this is a huge game, huge game. Just so you don't have to go on the road, you, you at all in the playoffs. You get a home, you get a home playoff game. You get teams have to come through you. You got to go through uh, Santa Clara, I believe, is where their stadium is. But you got to go through them to get to the Super Bowl. It's great, especially for a team as young and as 
with some guys that don't have as much playoff experience as some other teams. That'll be big to have those games at home. So this is a huge game for San Francisco. And then obviously if Seattle slides, if they find a way to win this game, you know, they're a little bit beat up. But, I mean, the Marshawn Lynch factor, I mean, Beast Mode's back. I didn't get to touch on that. Kind of a show between now and, and since Sunday. Or Monday, excuse me. But Beast Mode's back. That could either give them a boost or he may very well be out of shape and it might not mean anything. But I do think just just at the very much being in Seattle, that first Beast Mode, um, beast mode run, I'll get the fan juice up. Let them run for a long one, even score a touchdown. That'll really energize that crowd. So that, that could be the energy they need to get it back together. So they they win the division with the win, obviously. They get a first-round bye. Seattle does with the win and Green Bay loss. And they get home field advantage with the win and a Green Bay loss and the New Orleans loss. So, I mean, the last the Green Bay and New Orleans was in, probably isn't too likely. But, I mean, you never know. Stranger things have happened. But, yeah, no, this, I mean, there is so much up in the air. This weekend, so it'll be, there's so many there's so many important games for playoff positioning, playoff seating, all that stuff. So, I mean, it's I know it's week 17 and it's the coming up at the end of the year, but you're this this is going to be a one that if you're a football guy, a fan, you're going to want to be tuned in, you can be on your couch on Sunday, just because there's going to be so many games, so many scenarios that are still in play heading into Sunday that you don't there's so many possible outcomes you don't really know what's going to happen, and that's the beauty of it. You don't really know, and I mean. That unpredictability is a part of why we love sports and why we love football. So it'll be it's definitely gonna be fun be fun to watch. And going from teams that are fighting for their playoff lives to coaches that may very well be coaching for their jobs this weekend. Um, we will touch on those guys and some of the people I think could be have a little bit more motivation for this week seventeen game than others after the break. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. For the GSMC Sports Podcast. As I was saying before the break, there are quite a few coaches, I believe, that could very well be coaching for their jobs and trying to save their jobs this weekend. Just, I mean, as we know, this coming this coming Monday, Black Monday in the NFL, a day that all underperforming head coaches dread just because it could very well be the day that they lose their jobs. So there are quite a few teams, I believe, and quite a few coaches out there that are going to be trying their hardest to get a win this weekend to help show the ownership, show the GM, show the fans that, hey, look, I can still be your guy this year. Or for or, well, and for the future, not this year, because you've, you've already been a little up and down this year. But in terms of there's a, quite a few teams and quite a few games that I feel like teams are going to be fighting hard. Well, the coaches at the very least going to be coaching hard, trying to do everything they can to win those games in order to, in order to save their job, in order to keep – in order to at least stay around for one more season. Because, I mean, like I said, NFL is so unpredictable um, from year to year. You never really know who's going to be good, who's going to be bad. I mean, you know the pictures are going to be good. But other teams, a lot of other teams, like no one knew San Francisco was going to be as good as they were. No one knew Green Bay was going to be this good. I mean, they had Aaron Rodgers. No one knew the Green Bay was going to be this good. With a uh, first-year coach, no one knew that the teams like the Chargers were going to be so bad. Teams like the Falcons were going to struggle. Teams like the Cowboys would be seven and eight at this point in the year. The uh, teams like the Steelers would be on their third, third quarterback already this season. So yeah, there's so much unpredictability. So all these coaches are going to be trying to just, just like, please let me get one more year to fix this. I promise you, I can fix this. And I think one of those coaches that is very well coaching for his job, who we touched on last week a little bit in terms of the biggest disappointments of the year is 
and Jason Garrett, I mean, he's kind of he's kind of in a circumstance in a situation where there may very well not be much he can do to save his job, but I I would I tell you this much, they lose Sunday, then it's definitely done. At least if they win, they still have a chance to get into the playoffs, and if you get into the playoffs they still have the talent, assuming Dak's shoulder isn't too too bad to where they could win a playoff game, maybe even two. If San Francisco gets the one seed, I mean, San Francisco is less experienced than they are. I mean, they have a couple guys in, like, Sherm and Emmanuel Sanders who have the playoff Super Bowl experience, but Jimmy D will be new. Kyle and this will be new to him as at least the head coach. I mean, he was there as a coordinator with the Falcons, but as a head coach, this will be new to him. A lot of those defensive linemen, a lot of those receivers are aren't don't really have that sort of playoff experience that I mean even though the Cowboys don't have a lot of deep playoff experience they've at least been to the playoffs those guys have been to the playoffs two times already a lot of those guys and I mean they have guys like Michael Bennett who have been to a Super Bowl and won a Super Bowl they have they have some of those guys out there so not be big but yeah no Jason Garrett in my opinion is going to try to do whatever he can to make sure at the very least if he wins he wins this next game I mean that might not if they do that that might not be enough to keep his job I mean he only came to the year with one year left on his deals that already kind of told him he was on a little shaky standing and obviously this year hasn't up until this point gone how they wanted to go like I said all you need to do is get into the playoffs so if they get into the playoffs they can find a way to and they find a way to go deep into the play in the playoffs you never know that could, that could be enough to save his job but like I said at the very least they need to win this game because they they can't get into the playoffs if they lose this game so at the very least you need to just do that and let the chips fall where they may Hope the Giants, for their for Cowboys' sake, hope the Giants can um, find a way to upset the Eagles as battered and banged up as they are. That's the, that's not that far out of the realm of possibility. So, Cowboys yeah, just control what they can control. Jason Garrett can do whatever he can to do to make sure the team plays up to their standards. And then from there, the chips fall where they may. Speaking of the Giants, Pat Shermer is another coach who I believe is very much coaching for his job. I mean, he's he's he struggled in Cleveland. He hasn't been that great the last two seasons. But Daniel Jones has looked a lot better than people thought he was going to look. At least this at least this soon. I mean, there were plenty of people that thought he was going to go in the first round. Plenty of people that thought he could be at least a decent to good NFL quarterback. But there's a he has an outside chance of breaking Blake Manfield's touchdown record for a rookie. And, I mean, against an Eagles secondary that isn't that great. It's not out of the realm of possibility, at least especially coming off of his five touchdown performance last week. There's no reason to believe that he can't keep can't keep some of that late season momentum. So if if they can find a way and Pat Sherman can find a way to lead this team to an upset over the Eagles and knock them out of the play, or even if they don't knock them out of the playoffs, just find a way to win that game, that could be enough to convince um, the owners and Gettleman and even some of the fans would be like, hey, I mean, maybe some of the fans are out of them, but at least, at least um, convince management that, hey, let's hey, let's give this guy another year with our rookie quarterback, see what they can do, see if they can build on the success he's had late in the season. And then obviously, if it doesn't work out from there, then they, they can just be done with him next season because now he's on the last year of his deal or anything. So they'd be terminating it early. So I do very much believe that Sherm, um, I would be very surprised if, Pat Shermer has his team unprepared to play and he's come out and get blown out. Because if that happens, then I think there's a chance he might be out of there. But if they if they can if they can keep it close, they can keep it tight. If they can even find a way to even if they lose late, if they if they find a way to keep this game close with the Eagles and even find a way to pull it out, there's a very 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 good chance that 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 could convince enough people to be like, hey, let's give him one more year. You don't want to. You don't want to bring in a whole new offense with your rookie quarterback and with your young running back and all that stuff this soon. Like I said, it's only Daniel Jones' first year in the offense, and he's looked pretty good when he's been out there outside of like the fumbles and stuff. But yeah, he's looked good, so it's like that might be enough. And if you can, if he, if Daniel Jones can convince some guy, I would even though he's a rookie, I would still go to, I would at least get his input on it. If he likes Pat Shermer, then there's no reason to make your franchise quarterback or your your next franchise quarterback mad yeah I mean obviously he's a rookie so he only has so much to say like I said but you want him to be happy with the with the coach that he has in place just because you don't want too too much turnover and turmoil at that position because then that's how you can kind of ruin 
or a young quarterback at least, if he's having to cycle through coaches and cycle through offense and all that stuff earlier in his career, it's not really beneficial for him, in my opinion. So I do believe that if Pat Shermer can find a way to get the get the Giants to play well on this Sunday, win or lose, that might be enough to keep his job. And speaking of a guy who could be on his third, and speaking of a young quarterback that could be on his third coach in as many years, I think Freddie Kitchens is probably coaching for his job, too. I mean, it's his first year, but he just hasn't, in terms of the Browns, he just didn't, he hasn't looked ready. I mean, he doesn't have that much experience as a head coach, which is a part of the issue. Um, that was the reason why many people were, were, though they thought the Browns had talent and thought they could do good, were a little skeptical on the hire at the very least. Um, there's another one of scenarios where a coach gets hired because of his work with the quarterback and recently those ones haven't worked out. I mean, you tried, they tried, the Giants tried that with Eli Manning that didn't last very long. Um, the Bucks tried that with Dirk Cutter and Jameis and that didn't really work very long. And then this year, the offense, and I mean, Baker Mayfield's regressed. The offense hasn't put up the numbers and the yards and the points that you thought they would based on the talent they have on that roster on that side of the ball, at least. So, and I mean, that boils down to something. I mean, it's just one of those things where you where you give a guy who maybe is a better position coach slash coordinator um, the head coach position and he's just not ready for it. It can kind of just, it can ruin, it can ruin what you thought you were trying to help in terms of you trying to get some continuity with your quarterback, but and that coach can't just focus on the quarterback the whole time. He has to focus on the defense and the receivers and the running backs and the low line and special teams. Like, there's, there's the head coach has so many responsibilities. They can't just focus on making sure my young quarterback grows and improves as much as as much as he could if he was the offense coordinator or, like, a position coach or something. So he's definitely another guy who, who they're disappointed. I mean, I would, I'd would i be hard-pressed to believe they fire him after one season just, just with all the turnover they've had at that position in recent years. And like I said, the same thing what I was saying with Daniel Jones in terms of you don't want Baker to be on his third coach in as many years. And and just because that kind of dysfunction around your franchise quarterback can can be bad for him. So it's, it's probably best to at least... I mean, I would think they're at least going to try to give him one more year, see what happens from there. But, I mean, if, if um, any of these coaches, if they were fired... I wouldn't be surprised if they stayed. I wouldn't be surprised just because I think a lot of it's going to depend on how these games play out this weekend. If any of you guys go out there and get embarrassed, then, all right, yeah, no, that's probably going to be it. But if they come out, look good, the quarterbacks look good, their team plays hard, then they, they might be, that might be enough to convince people to be like, hey, all right, let's give them another year. Let's give them another year. And then, like I said, it's not like... you. I mean, I understand you don't want to move on from a guy... You want to move on from a guy too early as opposed to too late because if it's too late, then it's not really you might not have a chance to correct it. But like I said, you don't you don't just want to be cycling through coaches and all that stuff year after year. And and like I said, all these teams that I mentioned have younger quarterbacks, so you don't want you don't want too too much turmoil at that position just because it like great all that kind of dysfunction and stuff is not good. Just to look at the Patriots. I mean, they've had the same coach, same quarterback for twenty plus years. That's that's that should be the model teams try to follow and if and I mean if you just keep firing coaches every one after one or two bad years you're not going to be able to get to that level. I understand you're trying to find that guy, but you're not going to find him if you just continue to you don't give people chances. So that's how I feel. That'll be interesting to see how that goes, how those games play out, how this whole weekend plays out in terms of college football, NFL football, all that stuff. Even going back to the NBA to seeing if how LeBron LeBron deals with his injury to see what they deal with him. See how some of these teams bounce back back from their and their loss on Christmas Day, but it should be a very very fun weekend in sports. And I want to thank you for tuning in to another episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. Before I get out of here, I want to remind you once again to subscribe to the subscribe to the network, subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode. If you can give us a give us a five star rating, give us a review. It helps us get better, helps us improve, so we can make sure we're giving you guys the best content we possibly can. And that's it for me. I'll see you guys next time. Peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.